it was pretty silly to me at the thought that someone would really pick up the Christian faith and profess that, or any other religion to me, and right? I was dating a guy, he was a bouncer at a strip club. This just goes to show you, I grew up in church, right? The promises I made, I broke. And I just didn't think that God would love someone like me. When I met him, that addiction instantly left. And in that season, my faith began to collapse. You cannot ignore the reality of you the shortcomings of you, and then go search for a perfect guy. You're already starting off in lies. Hey tech fam, I'm really excited about today's video. We're gonna be sharing with you our Christian journey. We've talked about our journey into tech, but today we're gonna to be talking about our journey into the faith. Many of you know that we're believers, but we just wanna have a heart to heart and share with you our trials, tribulations, victories and how our faith has held us and kept us over the years all right fam so for context we are going to bring you back to the beginning and then we're going to wrap up with letting you know where we are now concerning our faith mm -hmm. and how do we practically carry that out okay so atia what was it like for you growing up in the context of the Christian faith. So growing up for me, I had a really good childhood. I grew up, you know, in a Christian home. We went to church two, three times a week. You know, my parents were married, you know, but again, it wasn't without its difficulties. It wasn't without its challenges. Okay. And, you know, I remember as a little girl loving to spend time in the presence of the Lord. Hmm. You know, I remember where I would pray for things and they would happen. So at a very early age, I understood the power of prayer. Mm. I understood the power of intercession. I okay. knew what it was like to spend time in the presence of God. So growing up a church girl wasn't a burden for me. I truly enjoyed my relationship with the Lord and I enjoyed my walk. And, you okay. know, then I got to high school and, you know, that's where peer pressure comes in. And, you know, just things that I had inner battles that I struggled with became highlighted and more prominent. Mm -hmm. So at a young age, I turned to alcohol. Okay. And I remember the first time taking that drink, it was a Smirnoff ice. I mm. did not know that that one sip was going to lead to an eight year long addiction. Mm. And I battled with alcoholism and struggled. Many times I said I would stop. I was going to quit. I was going to give up. Mm. And the next day I'll be right back at it. You know, I remember a season in my life where I literally would drink every day, mm. whether I was at home by myself, whether I was out, even in the movie theater. I couldn't hmm. enjoy a movie unless I was drunk. And, you know, it was a life where, wow. you know, I'm not a, definitely not pleased with it. Um, but I remember even in my drunkenness, hearing from God, I can remember sensing conviction hmm. that the way I was living was wrong. You know, it's a funny story. I think that I actually encountered an angel hmm. before because I remember, you know, I was in college in New Orleans. So we were out on Bourbon Street. It was me My and about, about four or five friends and we're downtown. <laughs> and I mean, I'm like lit, you know, and I remember a homeless man, you know, he looked at me and he pointed and he said, you, you don't belong down here. What are you doing? And it was so weird because at the time it was like, as he was talking to me, I kind of sobered up mm. and those words just pierced me. And when I look back on it now, none of my friends ever responded. Mm. None of them said anything. None of them acknowledged him. So I'm like, did I encounter an angel? Mm. You know, was God using things even while I was so far away from him? Was he using things to still remind me? of my life and my call in him calling me back to the path that I was supposed to be on. Another example, mm. I remember I had alcohol poisoning and I was so sick. I was literally, you know, just clutching the side of a toilet. Mm. And I just remember the room was spinning and it was just, just crazy, crazy experience. And I heard the Lord say, my daughter, what are you doing with yourself? Mm. You know, and I, <clears throat> thinking back to that day, it's like God meets us where we're at. Mm. That we're never too far for the Lord's 
conviction and his love. Hmm. You know, I never felt this judgmental, angry God. I felt a loving father that was disappointed with his daughter. And I remember the night where I came back to him, March 21st, 2007. Wow. And I was dating a guy. He was a bouncer at a strip club. This just goes to show you. I grew up in church, right? You know, (laughs) it's crazy. So we've been married 10 years. Yeah. And as many times as I've heard the story, I hear about your history. Yeah. I think even still, it's hard to like compute. It's (laughs) unbelievable. I know. When I think back. I'm sorry. Because for the record, y'all, however you see Atia on camera, Uh that's like really how she is. (laughs) Like, she's not pretending. Like, (laughs) she really is a very friendly, kind, just very holy, honorable person. And so, anyway, (laughs) keep going, Atia. It's just funny. Look, y'all let me know what... What do y'all think? (laughs) Right? You know, I'm getting emotional. I didn't think I would. I'm not an emotional person. Mm. But I think it just goes to show how far God will come for us. Mm. You know, how far his love reaches. Mm. That no matter what we've done, you know, and I did some things in my life that I am not pleased with. Things that I never said I would do, I did. Mm. Promises I made, I broke. Hmm. You know, and I just didn't think that God would love someone like me Mm. because I knew who he was. Mm. I knew the love of the father as a little girl Mm. and I strayed so far away. You know, like I was saying, I was dating a guy who was a bouncer at a strip club. Mm. This is what I, this is the life that I was now living away from home in college, far from God, far from the way I grew up. Mm. And I remember the guy that I was dating at the time we were living together You know, he ended up getting into a fight downtown and got arrested and it was a whole ordeal. So his family actually sent him back home to Texas. Mm -hmm. And that night he left, I was all alone in my studio apartment. And I remember just crying out to God. You know, Mm -hmm. I've been in one toxic relationship after another. And surely the Jesus I heard about as a little girl, Mm -hmm. maybe that love was what I was really looking for. You know what I said when I prayed? I said, Jesus, if you're real, will you be my boyfriend? Wow. That's what I said. I was looking for a relationship that wasn't going to disappoint me. Wow. I was looking for something that was real. Mm. You know? And after saying that prayer, the presence of the Lord showed up in my studio apartment. The same presence that I experienced as a little girl. He was there. So I I want you to continue. Mm-hmm. For anyone who's watching who may be similar to me, growing up, like, I mean, I was agnostic up until the point mm-hmm. where I became a Christian. So when you say the presence of God, mm-hmm. like, came into your room. Okay. Let me explain that. So if you were to close your eyes okay. and a person was to walk into the room, Hmm. You could feel, you can sense that a person is there. Okay. Whether they walk past you and you feel the wind move from someone walking past okay. you. Okay. But the way that I would describe this presence was so much love. Wow. You know, it's like the thought of like a person showing you room might seem scary, but there was no fear. Hmm. There was no judgment. Hmm. There was no condemnation. There was just love. Perfect love. Wow. And the love that I felt was so perfect that I knew I had to do something. Mm. There was something that was required for me to be able to keep this perfect love. Hmm. It wasn't going to come without a cost. Okay. So what I knew, no one saying anything to me. This is all happening in my room. No one is speaking to me. Mm. It was just something I knew I had to do. I had to clean up my life. Mm. So I went and got a huge trash bag and I had a shot glass collection because crazy. <laughs> when, I, crazy. when friends would go out of town, I would say, hey, when, you, when you're there, bring me back a shot glass. I had maybe like 40, 50 shot glasses. That is crazy. All over me. the country, all over the world. 
just on my counter in my kitchen. If anybody watching has ever collected, because <laughs> I, I don't really have a context for this, y'all. I, I, I didn't I didn't drink alcohol. So right. if anybody collect shot glasses or have done that, please drop that in the yeah, comments. Yeah, we want to know. That's we an interesting. Hear from you. That's an interesting concept <laughs> yeah. to me. I have bottles of alcohol in the freezer. I just threw everything away. Clothes. Wow. I had lingerie. I mean, I wasn't married. Wow. I had condoms. Wow. I just threw everything away. Wow. Because this perfect love, this perfect relationship, I didn't want to do anything to cause it to leave. Wow. Gosh. So, so life after that day. Never. I was never the same. Mm. Even to this day. So I, I tell people, you know, who struggle with alcohol addiction that what was so amazing is I didn't need to go through 12 steps. Now, I so admire AA and Alcohol Anonymous and, and, you know, we have friends who've gone through it and, you know, I, it's, it's got a place and it has a purpose for sure. Yeah, no doubt. But what God did in me happened instantly. Wow. There's no way to describe it. Wow. Or really justify it or explain it. Except that when I met him, that addiction instantly left. So I I know that we got to move on to the next points, but I mean, how, I, and I guess for me hearing that story, how do, how do you get to a point where, and, I, and I, you can't twist the arm of God, mm -hmm. but like, why would, why would the presence of God come into your space and you would just walk away from alcohol, mm -hmm. like cold turkey and like never go back to it? Mm -hmm. Like, like what, what? I guess I'm trying to figure out what emotional or spiritual state were you in? Really? You know, I was just desperate. Hmm. And I think that God meets us at our place of desperation. Hmm. And I tried everything. And, and would it be safe to say that you recognize really how, I guess, like messed up? Oh, yeah. You were. I was a mess. Like, like you, you knew it. I like you it. admitted it. I it admitted it. My life was a mess. My life was in shambles. The way that I grew up, the, the love of God that I knew as a little girl was now so far. I felt the disappointment. Wow. I, I felt like my life was literally unraveling and spiraling out of control. That I had to do something. Something had to change. These okay. men that I were dating, they, they were so toxic. It was so abusive. Okay. I was in these abusive, toxic relationships that maybe this man named Jesus that I heard about as a little girl, maybe that was the relationship that I needed. Wow. Maybe that was the love that I was looking for. Wow. Wow. And in my desperation and crying out to him, he met me. Wow. Wow. No, that's, that's powerful. And, you know, so I grew up around a bad environment, but almost still within a bubble mm -hmm. of in this apartment complex that we lived in that wasn't a bad apartment complex, just like everything around the apartment <laughs> complex was like bad, right? And um, so it's just funny. Like mm -hmm. I, I didn't grow up, I didn't smoke weed, I've never smoked weed a day in my life, mm -hmm. right? Um, but there were things about me that I realized over time, which is we're going to get into this, I guess. Well, I guess I can talk about it. What led to me coming to my salvation experience was I realized that I really was a screwed up person. Mm -hmm. I was a very deceptive person. I was manipulative. Obviously, I did, you know, the general sins, mm -hmm. right? Forn <laughs> fornication and, you know, I had anger issues, you know, the, the general stuff. But I didn't know what the concept of sin was. Mm. So like if someone would talk to me in a conversation and they would use the vocabulary sin, mm -hmm. I had no idea what that was. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't understand the differentiation of a person who was like a, a bad person in the context of before God. Mm -hmm. And now you need some type of redemptive savior. Like mm -hmm. that didn't make sense to me. Okay. And so I'm in a relationship with somebody. She got radically turned on to the Christian path, radically turned on to Jesus. I thought she lost her mind. Long story short, I'm playing football in college. I'm 
searching the scriptures. I'm trying to figure out if I'm right or wrong about this whole, you know, hell and heaven and God and the Bible. And, and I really started doubting that maybe I was wrong because of what I was seeing, because of what I was experiencing in that season. And then I came to this realization of how bad I was. Hmm. It, it was kind of like the light bulb went off because I, I never viewed myself as bad because I wasn't like an addict to like drugs or, or alcohol. Hmm. But when I really started understanding my nature and then I started trying to actually change certain things. So like, you know, I fornicated. I tried to like stop doing that. Hmm. Then I realized like I kept doing it. And then that's when logically that didn't make sense. I'm like, wait a minute. I don't have control like over my own body. Like I'm trying, I'm making a conscious decision to stop doing something and like, I can't stop doing it. That was weird to me. Hmm. But then who I was dating, she would always say, you got to, you just got to meet Jesus. You got to meet Jesus. What in the world? You got to meet a, a man who lived 2000 years ago. Hmm. That's weird, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I really had no other source to turn except to explore that experience. And then it just came to a season in my life where my behavior, my desires begin to change. The Bible started making sense to me in that season. And I really chalked that up to me getting a glimpse of the redemptive nature of who Jesus is and the fact that he justifies those, you know, who can't be justified any other way. And um, and that was really like the pivotal moment of, of where my journey began. Um, so what we at next. <laughs> so after choosing the Christian path, mm -hmm. what was life like? What was life like after choosing the Christian path? Just kind of talk about a little bit of why, what happened after that. So I explained, you know, just what happened on March 21st in my apartment. I really considered that like the day of salvation, mm -hmm. even though, you know, looking back on it, I really believe it was a journey. It was a walk, mm -hmm. you know, our Christian journey. So I grew up in church, walked with the Lord, backslid, came back. And now, of course, I know how important it is to find a church. Mm. So I'm visiting different churches in, in New Orleans at the time and ended up at a church, you know, and the church was just so radical in their approach, radical in their teaching, their worship. You know, they taught a lot about holiness and purity. And it was exactly what I was looking for. A lot of young people were there. A lot of, you know, I was at Xavier. A lot of fellow students were there. And what was happening at the church at that time, I really wanted to be a part of it. Mm. So I came to that church. I was there for many, many years um, serving in ministry and, you know, participating in the Bible college, mm. went to the Bible college, graduated, ended up working for the Bible college, mm. working for the church. For 10 years, I was on staff in the church. Like in ministry? In ministry. We were in ministry together at... <laughs> <laughs> at that church. Mm -hmm. That's that's actually where we met at. Yeah, that's where we met. Um, and, you know, it was it was a great time. Yeah. You know, because I think for me, um, you know, prior to that, the church I grew up in was different. And, mm -hmm. you know, this church was very radical. And it was just exactly what a young person would love. You know, because my faith and my salvation was so radical. You know, I'm in the club one day getting drunk. The next day, I'm carrying a Bible. So I would see, you know, people on campus. Preaching to people on, right. on the college campus. Preaching on, <laughs> yeah, standing on top of tables, preaching Jesus. And I, I would it. I would see people and they're like, you know, Tia, you know, hey, we're going out this weekend. And I would say, well, I'm not going, but let me tell you where I'm going. I'm going to prayer. You know, do you want to come pray with me? And yeah. they're like, who are you? Like, we were just with you getting high last week wow now you're telling us to come to church wow 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 it was radical wow and so you know i think because for me you know it was just black and white there was no middle ground i didn't i didn't want anything that had to do with the life i was living when i was in the world i wanted to be very far from that lifestyle and so i think i just literally went from one extreme to another mm. 
extreme yeah. worldliness and extreme yeah. alcohol and drugs and everything else yeah. to just extremely passionate for Jesus. So, so, so that's so that's interesting, and I'm curious to know, and I and I guess we'll get into it, the the pendulum swing, right? Mm-hmm. Like, did you, you know, did you ever start going back towards? Well, I know you never went back towards your your old lifestyle, but just what did it look like with you going from the far extreme mm-hmm. to just kind of where you're at now? And, and my story is similar to, to that. I was, as you can imagine, right? We married each other, right? <laughs> I was I was radical as well. Um, you know, lost a lot of friends mm-hmm. in the process. Um, some maybe accidental, a lot probably intentional. Um, you know, but yeah, you know, we, we served in ministry Mm -hmm. together. I ended up, I quit collegiate football after I I came, you know, to know God when I got on the Christian path, I really just came to the conclusion that it just, it wasn't for me. Like I wasn't created for it. I felt like I had to work too hard, you know, just to be (laughs) like red shirted and be on the scout team. And I'm like... God didn't create me for this. Like, I need to do something that will bring him glory. And ended up moving back to New Orleans. And, um, yeah, and that's when I ended up getting into church. Me and a friend of mine met a tea the first day. Mm-hmm. I was in a relationship at the time, so we didn't start dating until later Probably on. Years, yeah. yeah, but when we started dating, we, we were actively, heavily involved in ministry. Mm-hmm. We both have... Um, a bachelor's in biblical uh, ministries. It's a, from a non-accredited um, school, um, but but we, we were immersed, right? Mm-hmm. So you know the whole street evangelism, you know co- community, being in the neighborhoods, mm-hmm. mentoring, like yep. that. That was our life, yep. all the way up to we pastored a satellite campus church right. that was a part of the church that you know, that, that we were at. And then we actually ended up leading and directing the, the Bible college internship, you know, while, while we were there in that season. All right. So we're letting the questions guide us. So the next question is, what was it like being in ministry? I would say it was, Oh gosh, I can, I can talk about when it all started changing okay how about that yeah we'll, we'll, we'll get to that so basically atia as she said she was on staff for, for 10 years i was on staff for about three years prior to that i really just dedicated you know the priority of my time to doing anything that i felt was ministerial right so just i just wanted to be around the local church uh, money wasn't a priority to me. A savings account wasn't a priority to me. It, it it was just, you know, serve God in the context of what I thought was serving God. 2018, life changed for us. Hmm. 2018, both my wife and I's staff position ended mm-hmm. at that local church. Um, it was a number of circumstances that went into that being a very difficult season to process more difficult on me at the time um i had really banked a lot of the future of my life and how i was you know physically involved financially involved and i just felt like everything ended i can remember being a chauffeur standing in the airport one day you know, holding one of the signs. I think it was maybe a tablet I was holding. And and this guy walked by who I believe had visited the ch- the satellite campus church <laughs> that we pastored. Mm. And I can remember feeling so low. I mean, I go from, you know, being this pastor and I'm feeling like <laughs> I'm in this perfect will of God. You know, I'm not a second class or second rate Christian. Mm. I'm doing the perfect thing. And now I'm standing at an airport holding a sign. Hmm. It was it, it was just it was it was a hard thing for me to process. And on top of that, we were like dirt broke hmm. in that season. Yeah. I mean, when I say broke, I'm talking about as broke as you can get. Yeah. Right. 
we 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 had to get financial help mm -hmm. from family it was rough our yeah. second child was on the way mm -hmm. um in this season yep. and and in that season my faith began to collapse it mm -hmm. it began to collapse I, I began to take a fresh look at life at how i interpreted scripture how i interpreted the bible how i interpreted christianity um and i really wondered about the deity of christ in 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 terms of i i, I didn't walk away but i was so disarrayed that there were doctrinal understandings that i that i held so close in terms of how i interpreted scripture that begin to unravel to me as wait a minute this is some things that's not adding up right wow. so it, not to cut you off but please. i think what happened with you at that time is what we would call like a deconstruction yeah or, just yeah. to give people context yeah everything that you believed up to this point yeah was literally being yeah stripped away yeah and at the time you were ordained pastor yeah that's right that's right. I didn't say that. Yeah, I was an ordained pastor. At that so, time. you know, I think that that just points to, well, you could tell me, tell us, just share with us, you know, how does an ordained pastor question the deity of Christ? You know, when things don't add up, you know, it's, you know, truth has an interesting way of never changing. And no matter how passionate we are about a specific belief or a specific hill that we stand on concerning the Christian faith, if, if that hill is rooted in something that is incorrect, that is fabricated, that is untrue, truth will not change because we're passionate about it. Truth will not change because we speak loud about it, because we post on the Internet about it, because we chant it and rehearse it, you know, a thousand times to ourselves in prayer. At the end of the day, truth will not change. Mm. And for me, you know, I, I guess I was younger. I was, you know, my view of in a big Thing was how I viewed money in the context mm. of the Christian faith. That was one of the big factors. How did you view it? Well, I, I viewed it as basically, you know, God is like the stock market in a sense to where, you know, financial provision comes from sowing seed mm. into opportunities that a, a man or woman or God provides hmm. or that the local church provides hmm. not not even like you know giving to people in need not even that hmm. just an opportunity to sow into a person hmm. right that is that is my way out that is my ticket that that is how I'm going to provide for my family and when everything came crashing down, mm. after 10 years of radically serving the Lord in the context of what I thought was and, and being intricately involved from a serving in a, in, a, in a financial support, you know, from that standpoint, I had I had no no other option but to question. Oh, I felt like I would have been a fool if I didn't question. Because at, at the end of the day, okay, this isn't working. So either either I'm misinterpreting it or this guy don't exist. Like, what's what's up? Hmm. <laughs> and, and I went through this deconstruction phase and this journey of really wanting to discover what was true. And, um, yeah. <laughs> and what happened? How did you discover it? Ah, so a lot of scripture studying. A lot of note taking, a lot of digging to understand what did the Bible really have to say about giving and tithes and offerings. And, and listen, y'all, I'm not a theologian. I'm not here to have some type of, you know, doctrinal or scriptural layout for you. Um, but the more that I search myself is the more that I begin to understand that I was selfish 
I was ignorant to what it took to, you know, be a wise steward over my resources Mm -hmm. in, in both ways from a stewardship of what to do with what I have and also how to obtain more. I I was just ignorant to it. Right. It's like when, when, when you're in the context and, and you are surrounded by people who, who lack real understanding of how to provide, of how to get out of the, the paycheck to paycheck, of how to get out of that close to poverty level. And, and you hear, hey, this is your way out. This is your ticket, right? You know, I, I, I just, I was lacking. Um, but the more that I self-reflected, the more that I just kind of got my behind out there and worked, and started turning my attention to, okay, I got to take care of my family because at this point I really didn't have no option. Like I had to take care of my family, <laughs> right? The, and and the, the more that I got out there and I began to see how things worked, I guess you can say in the real world, so to speak. And then the more that I matched certain things up with scripture, it's the more that I realized, man, I was a selfish person. Hmm. Like, I mean, my giving my support wasn't so much rooted in the love for my neighbor or the well-being of the poor, the well-being of the orphan, the well-being of the widow, the well-being of the stranger. Like me really not understanding that I wanted to see the other person flourish. Mm -hmm. The giving was really just rooted in I want it to thrive. Hmm. I want it to prosper. Hmm. Right. And, and, and I feel like that's so contrary to the Christian faith. It's so contrary to the person of Christ. It's so contrary to, to the disciples. Hmm. Right. And, um, and that's really how I came to that. Hmm. And I began to pendulum swing. I begin to run far from it. Mm -hmm. I don't have it all figured out even now. A lot of it, I'm still processing (laughs) the journey, right? Right. But, (laughs) but, but I'm, but I'm looking to operate in the sincerity of my faith Mm -hmm. and, and with the integrity of my heart, Mm -hmm. I'm looking to function as close as I can to that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if I can, if I can function in, in the sincerity of my faith, the, in, the integrity of my heart, and just be honest before God about my beliefs, about what I don't fully understand in scripture. It's just, God, I want to be a person with integrity that truly loves you and loves my neighbor. That is just the path that I'm on. And I feel like that will put me in the best position that I need to be with the Lord. Yeah. And so what it sounds like I'm hearing is you went through this season where your faith was deconstructed Mm -hmm. and now what God is doing is reconstructing it. Yeah. And I think that's important because so many people go through these seasons of deconstructing their faith and they just stay there. That's good. That's good. You you can't stop. Yeah. At deconstruction. Yeah. That's good. Let the Lord remove everything that's not of him and rebuild, you know, and so many times, whether it's church hurt, whether it's, you know, like you said, you, your your faith was built on not solid revelation. Yeah. But works. Yeah. You have to deconstruct. Yeah. <clears throat> the Lord wants to remove those things. But then we have to allow him to reconstruct. Where Jesus is the cornerstone, the word of God is the foundation, Hmm. and let him reconstruct in truth. Hmm. Remove the error, remove what's not of him, but allow him to rebuild. So that brings us to this question now, Atiyah. Mm -hmm. So we, we decided to just basically just switch switch gears right Mm -hmm. you know things things change for us we parted ways with the church that we were at at the time you know you were there for about 16 years Mm -hmm. i was there for about 14 years basically throughout 
you know, my entire yeah. 20s for sure. Right. Um, most of Atiyah's 20s, obviously into our 30s now. Um, life looks different. Mm -hmm. We relocated states. We moved. We packed up like our family. Um, and, 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 and here we are, right? Yeah. We're in, but now fast forward, we are in a church. Mm -hmm. Yep. We're, we're in a local church. Mm -hmm. We are, I mean, we're, we're, we're walking our faith out, yeah. right? I mean, the, the faith is there. We, we have a, um, a level of discipline mm -hmm. in our life of, of whether it's prayer Mm -hmm. Whether it is raising our children up, mm -hmm. a discipline in searching the scriptures, yeah. right? Uh, uh, so the question is, mm -hmm. um, what does the faith journey look like for us mm -hmm. or for you mm -hmm. now in this season? Okay, so for me, you know, you shared about your deconstruction and reconstruction. So I remember when you were going through that in 2018. And I think I always wondered, like, am I going to go through this deconstruction? You know, is this going to happen for me? Mm. And I think the decision that we made, you know, to, to transition and to part ways with the church that we were in, I think that was the start of the deconstruction for me. Mm. And what started it, you know, if, if people ask, well, why would you leave a church that you were there for so long? The answer for me would be obedience. Mm. It's that simple. Wow. It was an act of obedience. I remember the Lord telling me it's time. Wow. And he told me that on two occasions. Wow. Now, he didn't say specifically. You know, he didn't give directions and mm. paint a picture and or gave me a roadmap. Mm. But sometimes when the Lord speaks, we know what he's saying. Mm. And I knew what he was saying the first time he said it. Wow. So talk, talk about this, this, well, first I want to talk about the deconstruction. Mm -hmm. Why would the Lord tell you it's time to move on? Mm -hmm. So when you say obedience, mm -hmm. like what, what was that like? Because that's a lot to walk away from, yeah. right? That that's a lot of relationships. Yeah. You know, the, the church wasn't necessarily a small church. Right. I mean, that. That was a lot. That yeah. was status. Right. 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 You know, you, we both were, were high leaders. Right. You know, in, in that ministry, what was that like <laughs> walking away from that? And, and, and why do you feel like the Lord right. would tell you it's time? Right. It was not easy. I was talking to someone and I said, the decision that I made was the most difficult decision I've made in my life at that point, at that point. Mm. It was the most difficult decision. The why, to this day, I still am not 100% sure. Mm. But I think that is the part of the journey. Mm. Will you obey God even when you don't know why? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. Are you willing to step out in faith even yeah. when you don't have the full picture? Yeah. Now, I can point to things and I can... Say, well, it could have been this, it could have been that, it was this thing that was going on, that thing that was going on. I could give reasons. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the big picture is still not 100% clear. Mm -hmm. But, but you knew. I knew. You knew in your heart. I knew in my heart. I had peace in my decision. Mm -hmm. Peace the entire time. Mm -hmm. Difficult. Difficult. Yes. So sometimes, a storm for sure. A trial for wow. sure. But peace even in that. So sometimes, you know, God telling you something doesn't always lead to the easy, convenient no. decision. The Bible says yeah. the pathway that leads to life is narrow mm. and difficult. And only a yeah. few people find it. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah. That journey, that Christian journey we're talking about is difficult. It's difficult. It's not easy. And it's real. And it's real. It's real. You got, you got to look for... The real truth. The truth. You, you, you got to be sincere in your faith. Yeah. You got to be sincere. You know, you you can search for God inside of a church <clears throat> and still not find him. You can search for God inside of Christianity and mm -hmm. still not find him if you're choosing to stand on a foundation of lies 
concerning your own heart. Right. Concerning your own beliefs. Right. It, you know, overlooking those convictions in your heart, overlooking like the impurities that are in you, exactly. like, hello. Right. right. And, 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 and that's the thing for me, you know, yeah, there was disagreement as I began to go through this deconstruction and this realization that, and I'm not even going to say it's a realization. There were things that I knew that I disagreed with, obviously, before and in the past. It's just that it was certain things that I wasn't willing to overlook at this point because circumstances that punched me in my mouth. Right. But even and I'm, what I'm saying is, even though there was disagreement, like we still have love for the people there. Right. We still have love for the leadership right. of the church. Like it's not it's just that we just came to a point in our life where. It was best for us yep. to follow the sincerity right. of our faith and the and, and, and the integrity and the and the conviction that was on our heart. Right. That it's better to obey God right. than man. That's yeah. just what we got to in our life. That's what it was. And so for me, that's when the deconstruction started. Because you, you gotta remember, right after I met the Lord, this was the church that I was a part of. Mm. So my radical salvation and and everything i learned up to this point it was at this church mm. so now everything is questioned mm. the deconstruction. everything was questioned i literally wow. looked at justin and i told him i'm about to become so different that i don't even know if you're gonna still like me anymore yeah that was kind of weird <laughs> i was like when, i was like what you mean like you got like a split personality or something <laughs> Like <laughs> when I tell you everything was on the chopping block yeah, yeah. and I evaluated everything mm -hmm. and removed what was unnecessary and kept what needed to stay. So you feel like you, you took a turn in your life to just do what mattered. Just do what mattered. Meaning you, you questioned if it was something on your schedule, you questioned, why am I doing it? Yep. <laughs> Everything was questioned. It Definitely was like you more effective. There was a <laughs> everything was on the chopping block. Yeah. And I was like, God, remove it. Everything that's not real, everything that's not of you, everything in me. There yeah. was a desire in me for accolades. Mm. There was a pride in me for my position and my title. You know, there was serving because being seen. Yeah. Yeah. So now you go from this place of leadership to now when the church we're you at. A, you a common church goer. We, you know, we sit close <laughs> to the middle. No, we're not in the back. We're kind of in the back. Kind of are close like to the middle back. back. Middle back. <laughs> but we're, we're there. And, yeah, we're there. And, we're there. And everything that now is happening is being reconstructed. Yeah. We can't stop at deconstruction. No. Okay, Lord, you've stripped everything away. Yeah. Now rebuild. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and now serving the Lord looks like genuine. Yeah. It's real. It's good. I'm not doing anything to please people. I'm not doing anything to be seen. I'm not doing anything because people are telling me this is how you're supposed to do it. This is what you should do as a leader. I'm doing it now just out of the sincerity yeah. of my relationship with God. Man. Bless God. So practically speaking, right? Carrying. So I want to start with this. Practically speaking, how, how do we walk our faith out? How do we carry our faith? How, how do we look to stay at a place where it's real? Well, for me, y'all, being real. So we're in tech now, mm -hmm. obviously. You know, y'all obviously know this, right? Y'all on the channel. Um, we're in tech. We, we, we got into this career change. We started this YouTube channel, you know, in the fall of 2022. And we've seen some success. We've, we were able to break into tech. We've been able to, you know, begin to grow this channel. And out of all of the preparation that I put into this, into my job, you know, I, I, it's a lot of calculation. It's a lot of study, right? It's, I still have not found something more effective than prayer. Mm -mm. And I mean that. Yeah. Like, hmm. like, it is so wild hmm. that 
I can study my brains out on a practical subject that I need mm -hmm. for my job and maybe do okay or not do as well. But then if I get to a point where I'm like, man, I haven't been praying enough and I just like X out my schedule and just like, yeah, I'm going to just like walk around and read my Bible and just meditate on scripture and, and look to get to an understanding of like, what is God saying right now? Mm -hmm. Go to work the next day and, and destroy, <laughs> wow. destroy. I mean, yeah. and I'm not, I like to say things that make sense. Cause again, I'm a former agnostic. Right. I didn't really talk about that too much, but like I didn't before I came to the Christian faith, I didn't believe in no religion. Like it was it was, you know, I try to watch my, my mouth now. It was pretty silly to me at the thought that someone would really pick up the Christian faith and profess that or any other religion to me. Right. I believe that there was a God because most people believe in God. So I was too scared to say, well, I, I, say, I guess God is there. But I'm saying it to say this. I don't like to sound overly spiritual or weird, but but we have a prayer life. Mm -hmm. So practically speaking, we we pray mm -hmm. like in our home, like we set aside time and seek the scriptures, sit quietly and listen for what the Lord has to say. And, and that practically speaking, mm -hmm. that redirects our mental space. Yeah. It settles our emotional space. Yeah. It, it allows for us to function in a level of, of peace mm -hmm. in what we're doing, right? It, it invades every area, I guess you can say. It yeah. invades our relationship, right? right? Be because in prayer, from a, from a humbling yourself standpoint and sincerely seeking the Lord with truth of believing about the state of yourself, whether that state is good or bad, it brings you to a place where you're willing to say, man, Bay, I, I was stupid for talking like that earlier. Hmm. The stuff that I said to you, hmm. you know, I really was tripping. Hey, mm -hmm. I want to be mad at you, but I'm, I'm real stupid mm -hmm. at times. Right. Right. Because, because of, it's the relationship with the Lord. Right. And, and so, you know, someone can ask, you know, well, how does a person have a good relationship? You know, because at the end of the day, like me and Atiyah, really, we really do have a, a very good relationship. And, and I'm saying that, humbly speaking, it's good. Like, we have a good marriage. It has been a good marriage for years. Mm -hmm. That is really chalked up in a, it's our relationship with God. Right. Like, at the end of the day, again, functioning from sincerity, conviction, integrity of heart. What I really believe about myself, when I recognize that I'm not as good as I would like to be, it forces me to have to apologize, mm -hmm. right? To have to be mindful of the other people in my home, mm -hmm. to be mindful of what's in it for my wife, what's in the best interest for my kids, right? You know, hey, I know that I want to rest, but what is it that my kids need, right? Mm -hmm. All of that carries over when it gets into being selfless, loving thy neighbor, mm -hmm. humbling yourself. It starts in prayer. Yeah. It starts in prayer with a sincerity and a truthfulness mm -hmm. in your heart yeah. as you're seeking for truth. Yeah, that's great. That's a great answer. And I think for me, you know, we just had a baby. So now we have four children mm. and, talk you know, it, as a working mom, Ooh, talk about it to you. It's, I'll be honest. Finding time to pray is a challenge again. The so narrow... that's why I'm always apologizing and not. I'm just playing. That, that would <laughs> no, be a he joke. Does no, he does apologize for No, but you do. Yeah, but the man's supposed to lay down his life. Keep going. He, he, he does I apologize first. You. So <laughs> for me, I think because... You know, you got to think radical salvation. I remember after I got saved, I would spend hours in prayer, you know, just days and hours and hours just soaking and basking. And then you get married and then you start having kids and it's like, okay, God, you know, I don't have hours and hours to give you. Wow. But what do wow. you have? What can you give? What mm. can you commit to mm. for me i like to pray at night 
And some people say, oh, we, you know, first thing in the morning, you have to pray. I'll be honest with you. I'm not a morning person. Hmm. In the evening, after all the children are down, while, you know, unwinding and just recounting and revisiting my day, Hmm. reflecting, that's the best time to pray. Hmm. And it's not hours. Sometimes it's minutes. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing that I've learned is that it's a relationship. Yeah. It's a journey. Yeah. It's a journey. You know, there will be a day where our kids are older and grown and I can have hours back. Yeah. But while I have small children, you know, what can you give? You know, what God wants from us is what we have to give him. So, but at the same time. I know that it's in that seeking the Lord and, and trying to find time, you know, throughout the day and find time in the middle of the night, you know, that pursuit, yeah, constant pursuit, pulling up my Bible app, reading, you know, different plans. It's the pursuit of the Lord that's never ending. Yeah. It's a desire for his presence that hasn't been, you know, diminished. Yeah continually day in and day out pursuing him seeking him knocking asking right yeah Yeah. and you know that he's there and he'll answer yeah and back to that perfect love that god does not condemn us yeah he does not you know he's not going to smite you because oh you didn't get a chance to pray today yeah you know but just that pursuit of that relationship with him yeah and it's not about how long You can pray or how much, you know, it's just about the consistency and the pursuit of him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, does your heart still desire time for him? Yeah. Are you carving out time in in the middle of the day or the end of the day or the beginning of the day to seek him? Do you find time to pull open your Bible and and read, you know, read a few scriptures? Do you have a plan, you know? Yeah. What is what does your walk look like? And everybody's walk is gonna look different. Yeah. Everybody's walk is gonna look different. We're all created differently. Yeah. We all have different schedules. We all have different schedules. Different we responsibilities. Have, yeah, we have different personalities. Different cultures. Different cultures. Different, different geographical locations. Right. So Everything <laughs> is so I can't compare my walk to someone else. Yeah. My yeah. walk doesn't look like my husband's walk. Yeah. Your walk is not going to look like ours. Yeah. But are you in the walk? Are you on that path? Are you on that journey? Yeah. And if you're not, get back on it. Yeah. Maybe you straight away. It's never too late to get back in in the walk. Yeah. It's never too late to get. And it's not a race. Yeah. It's a walk. Yeah. One step at a time. Yeah. One day at a time. Yeah. One minute at a time. Yeah. And looking for tr- looking for truth out of the sincerity, the sincerity of your faith yeah. and of your heart. Right. Being willing to believe the truth about yourself. Right. That is critical because we're a mess. <laughs> you, you, you cannot. Right. You cannot ignore the reality of you, the shortcomings of you, and then go search for a perfect guide. Mm. It just, it don't work. You're already starting off in lies, right? And, and, and so, Tia, how about, you know, we finish up in prayer. I, I suppose it's only fitting if we're, this is our Christian journey. <laughs> Thank everybody for tuning in. Um, let us know, you know, if it's, Anything specific that you want to hear about, that you want to talk about concerning the Christian faith, you watch this video, drop those in the comments so that we can take those into consideration. And Tia, you can close us out in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to seek you. And Father, we thank you for you rebuilding and reconstructing our faith. We thank you, Lord, that you are the chief cornerstone. We thank you, God, that our lives are built on you and built on truth. Father, I pray for anyone that's watching that may have strayed away, 
Maybe you've gone through experiences like ours where disappointment in church and disappointment in in church people has led you to a life where you don't even want to be a part of the faith anymore. It's not about man. It is about the Lord. So I pray for you right now that out of the sincerity of seeking truth, that you will come back to him, that you will come back to the Lord, that he is the perfect love that you need. And I thank you, Father, for touching hearts. I thank you, Father, for answering prayers. I thank you, God, for revealing truth. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for perfect truth. Yes. And I thank you, God, for restoration and healing taking place. Lord, I pray that our testimony has touched someone's life. And Mm. we thank you for using us to bring hope and healing and restoration for those who need it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our Christian journey. We hope that you join us and so that we can share our journey together until we see each other again.